Hi guys, welcome to SoccerNet Weekly. My name is Joba Gwale, the Chief Editor of SoccerNet.ng, and I'll be discussing with Lola Diade, with the Managing Editor of SoccerNet.ng. Hi Lola Diade, good morning. Hi Joba, good morning. It's good to see you again. Another week, we're thankful for the birth in our nostrils, the life we've got, and football. Good to see you, man. Yeah. Now, speak, speaking about football, yeah, uh, the last few weeks has been dominated by the George Floyd killing in US, uh, US, United States of America. Um, a couple of uh, footballers, players, clubs are taking a need to pay tribute to uh, the killing of the 44 year old black man and also support the Black Lives Movement. Now, I would like to ask what, what has been the reaction so far as uh, you stay in Germany and what has been the reaction of um, German clubs so far? Yes, um, the killing of George Floyd is unfortunate. It's terrible. It shouldn't happen to a human being. It, George Floyd, a 44-year-old black man in the United States of America, was killed by policemen. Uh, and we saw a video of four policemen kneeling on his body. One had his knee on his neck, and this guy eventually died right there. It is a shame that in the 21st century, American police are guilty of systemic racism against black people. And the fact now that protests are being uh, staged globally to call for uh, changes in the way black people are, are dealt with by the American system is justified. In the German League, uh, players like um, uh, McKenney of, of, of uh, Schalke, who is American himself. And interestingly, I interviewed McKenney in uh, 2018 when I traveled uh, on the tour of Bundesliga. Uh, he uh, ha had an armband, you know, uh, bringing attention to this cause. Also, Jadon Sancho, the British, um, the black British player, also. Uh, had a t-shirt under his jersey, bringing attention, calling attention to, to the Black Lives Matter movement and the killing of George Floyd and the protests in America, you know. So, and, and globally, you also see football teams now beginning to, to, to lend a voice to the killings. Yes, Roma, Chelsea, uh, Liverpool, Liverpool players going in, in their during training, taking a knee, you see, even Nigerian footballers, uh, as we reported on Didi, we fed in Didi, you know, you know, tweeted about it. And we see a global outrage in Berlin here. Uh, lots of people feel the in front of the U.S. Embassy to protest and bring, you know, attention to, to the injustice being faced by, by black people in the U.S. And, and, and in Europe, in Germany, you know, all over the world, you know. So... It is a movement that football uh, needs to be uh, keenly involved in because uh, you look at the football field, you see many black bodies. And if we do not, if football clubs, European football clubs who are the biggest in the world, who have all players from all over the world in their ranks, with several blacks, Africans, you know, in their ranks are not speaking up. Who else will? And it, so now it's, it's, and I'm happy that the football clubs are now taking a look at it because fact is there's also been racism in football in Italy. I, I remember interviewing, um, uh, uh, was, was, um, uh, Ekon, uh, William Ekong last December and asking him about racism in Italy. You know, so, there's racism in, in football. It may be different because when fans scream at you, the racism is different than when police are actively targeting black people, you know, for their, for the, because of the color of their skin and being uh, presumed uh, guilty before, you know, being charged, you know. So it's, it's important that we see football rising up to this occasion and footballers speaking out just as American food, uh, basketballers and uh, and uh, all that sports people are speaking. So it's important that soccer stars and soccer clubs are now leading and lending their voices to change uh, for, for, for people of African uh, origin all over the world. 
Yeah, um, I agree with you. There is a lot football can do. But then I would also like to point out that we should understand that football is also just a part of the society. It's just a sector of the society. Isn't it? So uh, even if we can use a football, football staff, football clubs can use their voice, voice voices also to channel their support for the Black Lives Movement, um, racial injustice, uh, racial killings against um, black men uh, in America or racism in Europe in football stadiums. I think also education is also important. Um, Jerome, what what thing was asked about something that okay, how can we stop racism? And he said it has to start from the early life of the child, which means as as parents, as guardians, we need to educate our our children, our child that okay because i have a different skin color to someone else does not mean we are different there's just only one human race that's true. just that's only true. one race and that's the human race so i think it is important for these kids because no one is born a racist no. no one is born a racist we everything that we every bad thing bad vices that we actually have anybody must have it was actually cultivated. It was learned. No one is born a racist. So it is important for the parents, for the guidance, for the teachers also to teach people from their early life that, okay, racism is bad. Having a different skin color does not mean, okay, you are different, you're, you're a different human being. So that was what Jerome Bratton said. So education is important because no matter what, if these players continue to shout, okay, there's uh, no to racism and everything. If the education, if the foundation is bad from, from the foundation is yeah. from home, you understand? There's little what football can achieve, you understand? So I think it is important for us to also start preaching about education also. Education, yeah, right. the, yeah, right. the, young, the young ones that are okay, this is the way to live life. This is because I have a, a different skin color does not mean I'm I'm different to you. So it is important that these kids need to be educated. Education yeah, right. Is yeah, right. Really, really important. I, I think the the educational uh, part is really important. The 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 from home love and 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 um, understanding and. Uh, uh, being open-minded is something that parents need to teach, you know, to curb racism. But we also see that the, the system, especially the way it is in the U.S. and many, many countries where black people are minorities across the world have, uh, have internalized the way to, to put down people of color, not just black people, they are, I mean, Asians, brown skin people, red skin people, you know, so, so many things that, 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 you know, are working against um, racial minorities in, in Europe, in the US, in South America, you know, so the human race needs to come together. And this is a turning, this should be a turning point, this, this situation, because I, I don't recall football, you know, soccer having supported uh, anything like this before, you know, and I also believe it's because of the way the world is right now. The, the lockdown sh has shown, the coronavirus has shown that we are all humans first before, you know, we are different colors. So now it's, it's helping everybody have a better perspective, you know, especially in, in, the, in the sports, in the football business, you know. So I think it's, it's a good thing that, that soccer teams are raising their voices and letting their voices to be so. But that, that, that is all for me. Yeah, hope, hope, hopefully, though, in the next few years, we'll see massive changes and we won't be back again talking about the same issue in the next few years. Mm -hmm. But moving away from George Floyd and how players supported the Black Lives Movement, uh, Matter Movement, uh, this week, I would like to come back to the open front. This week, um, the president of the Nigeria Football Federation, Amaji Pini, hosted uh, at the media chat with journalists. And here are some, some interesting takes we have made. 
So uh, I was in the meeting. Uh, you you were also in the meeting. But the two things that that actually I can pinpoint from what he said was about cutting the funding of national teams, and some and some of the national teams also will be disbanded because of the um, effects of the coronavirus. Then two, he said the objective set for gender well, um, are not set in stone. So it is flexible. It doesn't mean if, if you win, if it does not win the uh, Africa Cup of Nations, it will get sacked. So I will. I have my own opinion, though. But I would like to hear what you what you think, especially concerning cutting the finances of uh, national team and doing away with doing this, disbanding the big soccer thing. Yeah, he said the big soccer team will no longer be because they can't be paying for a uh, team to go and lose its zero. At the World Tournament, so I would like to hear what, what you what you think. Okay, so um, the truth is that Nigerian football, like many football organizations across the world, will need to rethink its strategy, its management options in the post COVID nineteen era. Financially, everyone is struggling. Even their sponsors, as uh, Mr. Pinnick uh, agreed to. And now they have to renegotiate contracts and ensure that they keep those people on board while uh, hoping that new sponsors come in. So, the, uh, so it definitely means that there will be reduced funding for their projects, youth development, uh, national teams. And now you look at it in, in, in perspective, which national team really brings in uh, money to the NFF, it's the Super Eagles. Super Eagles yeah. Even the Super Falcons, it's uh, really uh, limited because um, I, I recall only one main sponsor for them during the. I recall just one main sponsor for the women's team, uh, the 2019 World Cup from Nigeria last year. Only I'm still more you know. So, but for the Super Eagles, this is the cash cow. And you look at the other teams. Uh, the interesting thing is that the beach soccer team had been disbanded since last year. They had been told they wouldn't be funded anymore since last year. So he was just reiterating uh, about it. We don't have a futsal team. We haven't funded the futsal team in a long time. And then it leaves the, the youth teams under 17, under 17 boys and girls. Under 20 uh, boys and girls, and then under 23 men, and it's it's really tough running all these teams when the financial returns are really negligible. But it's they are important in the in the pipeline of talent. You know, you need talent. You need to develop talent through the youth teams, and then so that they grow into your adult teams in future. Unfortunately, um, the funding to them, I think we, over time, those youth teams have been used in a way that has shown, I mean, made them feel like they are just utilities. We only bring a youth team together. We don't have a youth league, a youth system, a nationwide youth system that keeps these players uh, active, you know. So, uh, it will be a disservice if the NFF stops funding youth teams. But he also said that what their plan is, is to uh, uh, discourage the payment of bonuses and you know, they will reduce funding of match bonuses or match camp allowances. The teams will only be able to earn money, the youth teams, if they get to a tournament and they you know, do substantially well and get uh, tournament uh, winnings, and then they can keep the tournament winnings 100%. That's the only way they will, they will be kept. But what I see happening is that Nigerian youth teams, Niger the Nigerian Football Federation will struggle for funds. I do not know um, how they will do in, in terms of funding, because even the national budget has been reduced, you know, and sports... Um, 30%. Will 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 we'll suffer it a lot too when we need uh, hospitals, we need schools, you know, sports right now. If 
it cannot achieve private funding under the NFA will struggle. On the second part for Gennard Rowe's contract, I believe that now that Rowe has signed a new contract, and if he wins the AFCON or not, it, it is now in the ball of the NFF. It is now the court of the NFF to, to keep him or not. It, it, it's going to be, he's, he's, he's going to be judged on his results. But I hope he does well so that he keeps his job and takes that team to the 2022 World Cup. You know, there are forces uh, against him. There, there were forces against him. And there will continue to be people who doubt him. So now he needs to prove himself. And a, a coach's uh, job is as good as his last resort. So it's up to him to, to, to prove himself and, and, and hold, keep that contract to the end. I think you said uh, everything about that, but I would like to add my few points on Janet's first contract situation. Uh, the uh, Penix said, and the NFF president said, uh, the objectives are not set in stone. And the two objectives are to win the Nations Cup and to lead the team to the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. You understand? Uh, I think uh, he. That that um, Penix statement does not clear everything, and I think Raw has worked into a difficult difficult situation. But well, what I just don't understand is that the African Cup of Nations, the African Cup of Nations, is likely will likely be postponed to 2022. Now, should Raw fail to achieve the target of winning the Nations Cup, does that mean the NFL will sack the Super Eagles coach? just months before we go play at the 2022 World Cup, which means we'll start a new manager will be bringing, will be brought in, and then we'll start rebuilding again. So I actually don't understand. Oh, but, how, but you see, it's, it's been done before. It's been done. We that was in 2020. I'm not doing twice, twice. And, and in, we actually saw, in 2002, Mm-hmm. After the Africa Cup of Nations in Mali, he was sacked, and then we went to the World Cup with Coach uh, Nibinde. And then in 2010, yeah. he was sacked after the Cup of Nations in Angola, and then we went to the World Cup in South Africa with Lagerbach. So nothing, also, is, uh, nothing is strange in Nigerian football. Though. And we saw, we, <laughs> they and we saw how the two, uh, how it all ended for us. I think those are our two worst World Cup tournaments. We, mm. we, we didn't win any game. Uh, we had just one draw and we mm-hmm. lost two, lost two games. Mm-hmm. So I think I think uh, the object. While I think the objectives are realistic, they are, they are realistic targets. I don't think it should be something that should cost him his job if he fails to win the Africa Cup of Nations. Also, mm-hmm. Nigeria is definitely one of the favorites to win next Afcon. But we all know that tournament football is also always tricky. It's not really about having the best team or, or, or so. So, for example, Jamie had to, in, in the piece that I wrote, Jamie had to stay for like 12 years before they could actually win the World Cup in 2014. Yeah, so, I, I, I don't believe that, okay, if he fails to win the Africa Cup of Nations in 2021 or 2022, then he should be sacked. Because it doesn't, then why offer him a new contract then? Let him stay for the two years that he signed. Then we can now bring in someone else to come and take over. I think that's just my two cents on this. On this I, 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 I wish it would happen, but I know that football uh, management in Africa and Nigeria is more complex, but we hope for the best for Gera Pro. I'm still sticking, <laughs> sticking with the Nigerian uh, national team. Uh, we were arguing about what, what, what was Mikel's legacy in the national team. Yeah, I said he was just another player in in the Super Eagles. You said he's a great player. So I, will, I have my own reasons. You have your own reason why you said he's a great player. But past, to me, I think Mikel, you can't say Mikel is in the class of Austin J. Chiokocha, um, the likes of Emmanuel Amunike, uh, Victor Ibeba. So to me, he was, he had success, he had everything, he won everything at club level, 
We won the Africa Cup of Nations with Nigeria also. But I think Mikkel's influence was overrated. I, and I think he was just another player in the national team. I don't think you will see any play, any any child growing up now and saying, okay, he wants to grow up and be like and be, and be like Mikkel. You understand? His influence, his influence, you can't complain, peer his influence, that of Bokucha and Khan. And, and can I'm not I'm not disputing the fact of that he won a lot. I think the best the best tournament Mikkel played for Nigeria was at the under 20 World Cup in 2005. But since he moved to Chelsea, when he moved to Chelsea, when he was converted to a def defensive midfielder, I think that was when he lost his spark. Although some will say Andrea Pilo also was as a, also started as an attacking midfielder before he was converted as a register and Pilo, Pilo excelled in that role. So why? So it's it's just like making an excuse for for Mikio. Well, okay, I so Joba, I, I, you've talked, you've talked, you've talked your own. You keep talking yeah. about this. Let me say, if you say that the child, no child, that first point that no child in Nigeria grows up wishing they were Mikio. Let me tell you the truth is. Your best player right now, your high, your greatest, your your highest rated player in football right now, is Wilfred Ndidi. Wilfred yeah. Ndidi has granted an interview in the past where he said he wanted to be Mikel. He modeled his game after Mikel. Your well, midfielder, Mikel, uh, under twenty it? former under twenty <laughs> captain. Um, uh, Aziz, who, Ramon Aziz wanted to be Mikel. Who, who All these Zaman guys Aziz? wanted to play who like knows, Mikel. Who knows Zaman? We felt in the D is a defensive Luke, midfielder, so it's normal Luke, for him to say, Luke, Okay, he wants to model his game around Mikel. That's what I'm saying. It's normal to even at the 20th, even, even at the 20th, 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 Mikel was not our best player. Then I told you. I said I will have Sunday Umba and I will have Victor Moses. I will have Emmanuel in many cases. Sunday Umba played two games. How can you yeah, say? Sunday, Sunday, Mikel Sunday Umba played five games. Sunday, Sunday Umba played man of the match in four of them. Sunday Umba played two games and we can actually feel his impact. Sunday Umba wasn't even impact. the man of the match in that final. Do you know that? Sunday Umba I, was not even the but, it was Mikel that was man of the match but, in that but, final. But, but but it's got the most important goal. No, but final. what I'm saying is it's got it's got the most important goal. And you know, you know, you know one thing about awards, I've said it over and over and again that awards are popularity contests. It's not really about okay, you did well or something, you did well or something. But Joba way, Joba, just, Joba, about, you you don't you seem not to understand how the man of the match is chosen. The man of the match is selected. The, the man by of the match the is selected by so, yes, by and the journalists the technical and, people in the stand so it is not, during the yes. game. It yeah. is not a, con a contest for popularity. It is the most effective player in the game. Yeah. When yeah. your and colleagues or people who had more experience <laughs> than you cho choose someone as the man of the match for a game, you should respect it. And you know, you know, you know we watch football the, different way, in different you, ways. You are, I think you are, you are rev revising or revisioning even your your great you 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 claim JJ Okocha JJ Okocha wasn't even I mean he won only one Afcon at his and this was when he was starting out his career yeah at his greatest off. at his greatest no, he couldn't single handedly but, win an Afcon but but, but we but nobody single handedly no, win an Afcon but Mikel but, led Okocha a team was unlucky of Okocha new was players unlucky. forget Okocha about was unlucky. Okocha, Okocha was at the height of the powers in two thousand and four in two thousand and six we did not win. Mikel was the most experienced player in the in the out in the outfield, and he led a group of young players to win the Afcon. You need to res put some respect on his name. I am not saying I don't respect Mikel. You are disrespecting him. I respect what he achieved for Nigeria. He won Afcon. He did very well at the Under Twenty Youth Project Championship. He led well, a team to the Olympic let, Games let, and let, won bronze. Let, a let, team let, that he financed only, from his pocket only, that he paid only, for their flights. 
I don't think Olympics count. I don't think Olympics, hey, o- o- Olympics, Olympics, count. Oli- Olympics <laughs> count. That's an Olympic bronze medal. You are an Olympic, Olympic bronze medalist. What what I'm just saying is that Mikel never had many wow moments for with the Nigerian national Look, team. In that yeah. in that tournament, he had he had three assists. He had three assists. Oh. One, two for Emenike, I, one for Musa. That same yeah. year, that. Had, that oh, Oh goodness! I I, I think ne, ne, you Mikel are. never, ne, Mikel never, Mikel never had many wow moments for Nigeria. Okay, you can't really. Do you remember? It. Do you remember okay, Nigeria okay. Cameroon in Calabar in in Uyo? Nigeria Cameroon yeah, in, in Uyo. Uyo. Yeah, yeah. Did yeah. you remember? It was Mikel that gave Igalo his first the first goal. He assisted yeah. the first goal. And then, he scored, he, scored, the and then he scored the second. And you said second Mikel never goal. had wow moments. Joba, okay. it's like you. Please, it's like please, you just please. decided let, that let, you are please. not. Let, 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 me, let me ask you a question. Mm-hmm. Uh, name five top matches that Nigeria played and Mikel was, was great in those games. Just five. Nigeria versus Cameroon in Uyo. Nigeria but. <laughs> I would have prepared. No, wait. I would have prepared if we knew, if I knew this was good. But you you don't just jump on me and say five games that Mikel played. I it's been no, a while. But, I think. But I can. Is, but, but, I can is, have, but I can have five matches that Okocha have played without even thinking about it. That and you, you uh, because matches. because you you studied it. I look. No, no. I didn't study. I didn't study it. Look. But what I'm saying is, is that they play different. They play differently. <laughs> look at they play differently. Mikel was a defensive midfielder. Yeah. JJ was an attacking midfielder no. and a very Mikel played as player. an attacking midfielder. Mikel played as an attacking midfielder in the Super Eagles. He played as a defensive midfielder in at club level. Those are two. He played uh, he played behind the striker most times during his Super Eagles career. Even at the later the part early of his Super Eagles career, career, really. The 20, early Super 2019. Career. Even at in 2019, I remember our opening game against Burundi. He played behind the striker. Mikel, the Mikel of 2019 was not the Mikel of uh, 2013. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. That he Look, played the Mikel of he, uh, Confederations Cup in 2013. Yeah, 2013. Look, let me just don't disrespect Mikel's. Um, it's easy to look back and say somebody was better because they were more flamboyant. But look at the effect of a career of a long career with the Super Eagles. Now, what he now, did, what he achieved. He these did, are two different things. I think he these did are two better. These are no, two but different. okay. So what? What are you? Off, what are you? Off, what is your judge? Off, what are you judging? You know, on of 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 the pitch, of the pitch, in terms mm. of respect and everything, players respect Mikel. He was he was off the pitch. He was their he was their captain. Understand? But what I'm talking about right now is action on the pitch. Action on the pitch. Mikel never had. At most, he had just top five, one top five moments with the Nigeria national team, and that that was it on the pitch. I'm not talking about. I respect his achievements. I respect okay his influence in the team, but on the pitch, on the pitch, I'm talking about on the pitch. Mikel had just maybe one top five, top five games for the Super Eagles, and I I, I don't think it is it, it is it is a lie. I don't think anybody would disagree with me. That's, I disagree with you. Too. I disagree with your. Yeah. With your your perspective, which is which uh, uh, belittles a great career in the national team or for John Obi Mikel, I think you are wrong. I believe that you are being revisionist about John Obi Mikel's impact in the national team, uh, and it's it's a sad because this will continue happening. A new generation of uh, journalists or young people will come and poo-poo the previous generation players or something. It is wrong. I was, I was at the Africa Cup of Nations in 2013, which was Mikel's greatest year in the Super Eagles. And he was the fulcrum of that young team. He was the most experienced person. And he kept them together. He kept them focused. And you don't have to play fancy. Mikel, Mikel did the simple things. He did the simple things. He cut down attacks. He broke down attacks of opposition. Mm-hmm. And that he did it effectively. If you look at highlights of Nigeria versus Cote d'Ivoire, there was a yeah. last minute attempt by Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, and yeah, Mikel was the final defense. Yeah, Mik- I from, think it was against he, he blocked it. He just jumped in. That is the quality of a leader. 
there was a there was one attempt. I think somebody was Mikel was the last line of defense. Mikel took a yellow card for the team in the World Cup in, in Brazil. There are many things I see that is not about the flair or the goals that Mikel did as the fulcrum, uh, as the leader in the middle, keeping people grounded. Of course, he became slower towards the end of his career, which you are most likely referring to against Burundi, against this and that. But at the top, Mikel led an effective team for Stephen Keshi at 2013 AFCON. And you have to weigh the achievements of, if you, if you are saying, ah, JJ, JJ this and this, JJ that. But you look at the quality of the players that Mikel played with and the quality of the players that JJ played with. You can't compare them, but Mikel led. Mikel, but did he win the Afcon with Okoronko? <laughs> Mikel played. Mikel played. JJ played with Onkanu. Uh, did he win? He didn't. Okacha, JJ's uh, only uh, Afcon uh, title uh, came when he played with Yakini uh, and uh, Amunike. JJ, JJ reached the semifinals twice. Twice and Mikel yeah, won. Mikel, Mikel reached. I think Mikel reached. Mikel reached three times. Mikel won three bones. Three bones is two. No. In, in two thousand and six. Twenty ten. Twenty ten. And twenty nineteen. Twenty nineteen. JJ won three. Nations Cup. Mm -hmm. Won silver and won the bronze. In With, Mikel didn't win silver, which year we didn't get to any final that we lost. JJ, I'm talking about JJ. I'm talking about JJ. I'm saying, JJ yes, which one? Which, 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 which silver? 2000. 2000. I've got 2000 ah, final. Okay, yes, yes. Yeah, I've got 2000, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, he's got two goals. Yeah, those are things that I'm talking about. No, I look two at goals. And you, <laughs> two goals and you didn't win. <laughs> No, but you, but you had Victor Ekpe by African Football of the Year in 1997. Look, look, wait. You had Victor Ekpe in that squad. You had Juan Kokanu, two times African Football of the Year. But you couldn't win the AFCON. JJ you had Jani Babangida. JJ, you had George Finiti. You had Sunday Olise in that squad. JJ, JJ won games on look, his own for Super Eagles. Joba, we know. Mm -hmm. But look at the quality of players they played with. Yeah, yet yeah, they couldn't win at home. They couldn't win at home. Okay. Anyways, I think this argument will not it will never for, stop. It will never stop. But for, I just said let's for, respect John B. Mikel's. I, res I respect I, res I respect Mikel's I respect Mikel's influence of the pitch and among the players. I just and on, on the field he was immense. He was I, the I, best I just, player I just we had on, at the twenty thirteen AFCON. You have to let's leave it at that. We are taking yeah, yeah. no no problem, though. Anyways, public fans will help us to settle this. And so, guys, let's hear your comments in the section. In the <laughs> comment section, send us your feedback. We want to know what you think. This argument will never end because um, what, we have to let you go. What would be Mikel's legacy in the national team? Was he a great player or just another squad, another player in the national team? Talking about his performances on the pitch. But anyways, um, we've come to the end of this week's show. Um, this weekend, the Bundesliga... Is back again. Start from from next weekend. The La Liga uh, La Liga will resume. Then June twenty, the Premier League is back. So I think this month started on a good note, and we are glad to have football back. So we'll be back again next weekend to talk about a series of interesting topics. So um, I'll be here again. My name is Olua Jabagunwale, the chief editor of Soccernet of NG, and Lola Day also will be here again. So, do you have any final words to uh, Thank you uh, guys for watching. Thank you for staying tuned. We wish for your feedback. Enjoy your weekend and um, take care. Enjoy football. Ciao. All right. All right. Bye. See you guys next week.